Greetings, and welcome to another episode of Basically is Biblical. Yes, this is another episode on today, the Sabbath, the 19th of February, and uh, hopefully you're joining us and you have just finished listening or listened recently to part one about uh, beginning the holy year in a holy way uh, at the first month designated by the Lord God, our creator, the first month of the year, the first lunar month cycle, beginning, uh, technically speaking, with March. And we had that discussion um, in the first part. But we want to talk about and continue to talk about what what should we really be putting in perspective when we talk about a new year and what we should be looking for in the new year. Oh, we know what man says. Right? All those resolutions, new year resolutions, which by now... Uh, statistics have shown that by now most people have forgotten or uh, forgotten those resolutions or put them aside because they couldn't follow them you know uh, if it was if it's not something that the Holy Spirit led you to do don't do it right just like the fasting if the Holy Spirit hasn't led you to fast don't do it just because man says so don't do it just because it seemed you know Oh, this is your idea, your plan. Because you know what Ecclesiastes says about, you know, man's ideas and plans. And you know what the Lord says. Man plans his way, but the Lord should order his steps. Amen. Uh, so, um, you know, if the, if the Lord is not leading you into a certain area, then uh, and, a, and a certain activity, then by now we should know that we uh, should not be getting involved in that and that extends to these quote-unquote new year's resolutions not to mention by the word of god by his order and decree january according to the gregorian calendar right is the first month but his decree was that april abi or in the hebrew nisan is the first month and so what should we be doing how should we be trying to line up with his word First of all, by acknowledging his feast and his appointed times. We talked about that being in Leviticus 23, and we talked about that uh, the last and first part of this session. Uh, this session on beginning the new year on the good foot. On the good foot, right? Get on the good foot. So let me go ahead and start with a prayer before I get too carried away, as I did in the first part. That kind of carried away there, and um, I did pray first, but uh, we prayed at the end. But I'll I'll start now with our uh, with the prayer. Oh Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth! You are the God of the God and Father and Creator of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. El Elyon, Elohim, Adonai. Our Lord, our Savior, our Master, Yahuwah and Yahushua. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come before your throne and sit at your feet to learn of you, to continue to gain understanding and wisdom through the power and sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Father God, we ask that you will continue to... That you would continue to hear our voice and hear our pleas for healing in our bodies, healing in our minds, our souls, as we ask and seek preparation for your appointed time. As we seek to guide others in your appointed times and knowing that we are indeed in these last days when we should be looking for the blessed hope of your return and to be able to dwell with you forever and ever. Lord, I know that there's some people who are going through a lot of 
trials and tribulations, whether they be earthquakes or floods or famines or physical harm and danger, brutality and oppression, persecution. And there are many, Father, Savior, Master, King, that are struggling with finances, struggling with worldly issues, consumed by worldly <laughs> desires. Lord, we ask that you would continue to be in their minds and hearts. Continue to guide them in their thoughts and their actions. Make your presence known, O oh Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Give them the the words of healing, the love and the compassion that only you can provide, the peace and the joy that comes from knowing you and being in relationship with you. O oh Lord, our God, we thank you for forgiving us of all of our sins. Our, those things that we know definitely that we have done that we need to repent of and bring to light those things that are not known to us. We know, Father, that ultimately a relationship with you, walking in your ways in accordance to your will, is the only way that we can have that joy and peace, knowing that we are in right standing with you. The righteousness, the right standing that we seek is not found in the world and according to its behaviors and actions, but can only be sought and maintained. And so, Father, we just ask that you would continue to be with us and guide us. We know that there are people, you know, as we said, that sometimes are suffering from extreme illness, dire illnesses, um, don't know what to do or where to turn. And Father, we know that you have the answer. You, you created us, and you know the best things for us. If there's something, Lord, that we can lead them to, whether it be in treatment or guidance or food or medications, or, you know, Lord, you made everything. And we know that only your answer is the best answer. We know that only through this, developing this relationship with you, um, and being led and directed by the Holy Spirit is where we get the permanence, the permanent joy and peace regardless of our situation. And we ask all these things in the matchless and mighty name of Yeshua, your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen and Amen. So I just want to jump right into it the second part. Remember, it's about uh, getting on the good foot, staying on the good foot for the whole year uh, and, and in multiple years to come. Amen. And I just want for us first to start out by reading Romans 14. Romans 14, starting at verse 11. For it is written, and I'm, of course, reading from the Amplified uh, Classical Version. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, acknowledge him to his honor and to his praise. And then, of course, we know that Isaiah 45 and 23 also repeats this idea. Verse 12, and so each of us shall give an account of himself. Give an answer in reference to judgment of God. Then let us no more criticize and blame and pass judgment on one another, but rather decide and endeavor never to put a stumbling block or an obstacle or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am convinced and persuaded as one in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is forbidden as essentially unclean, defiled, and unholy in itself, 
But nonetheless, it is unclean, defiled, and unholy to anyone who thinks it to be unclean. But if your brother is being pained, or his feelings hurt, or if he is being injured by what you have eaten, then you are no longer walking in love. You have to cease to be living and conducting yourself by the standard of love toward him. Do not let what you eat hurt or cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. Do not therefore let what seems good to you be considered an evil thing by someone else. In other words, do not give occasion for others to criticize that which is justifiable for you. After all, the kingdom of God is not a matter of getting the food and drink one likes. Instead, it is righteousness that state which makes a person acceptable to God and in their heart, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He who serves Christ in this way is acceptable and pleasing to God and is approved by men. So let us then definitely aim for and eagerly pursue what makes for harmony and for mutual upbuilding, that is edification, and development of one another. This would be the foundation scripture reading added to the first part that we discussed earlier today, if you listened earlier. It is important for us to keep this foundational scripture reading in mind because we're talking about the idea of ignorance, indifference, idolatry, right? We're talking about deception and how that leads us into idolatry, the lack of knowing and the unwillingness to know as we covered in part one. But once we know something for ourselves, right? Remember what Paul just said. And I bring this to mind because there is so much, uh, there's so many voices out there who uh, would cause you to go into condemnation over uh, whether you eat pork, whether you eat shrimp, crab, you know, whether you dress a certain way. you know, whether you, perhaps even this topic of, you know, the, the, the right name, the correct name of the Most High God, Yahuwah, Yahushua, Yahusha, Yahweh, you know, Jehovah. We must be reminded that we should not allow, as Paul is telling us, these things to become a stumbling block. They should not become uh, part of what what Timothy, what uh, Paul was uh, telling Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 through 26 about useless controversies. We should probably even just read that. And then we'll come back to Romans 4. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. But refuse, shut your mind against, have nothing to do with trifling, ill-informed, unedifying, stupid controversies over ignorant questionings, for you know that they foster strife and breed quarrels. And the servant of the Lord must not be quarrelsome fighting and contending. Instead, he must be kindly to everyone and mild-tempered, preserving the bond of peace. Just what Paul said in Romans. He must be a skilled and suitable teacher, patient and forbearing, 
and willing to suffer wrong. What does that mean? It's okay to be wrong. It ain't when you're wrong. Learn and move on, right? He must correct his opponents with courtesy and gentleness in the hope that God may grant that they will repent and come to know the truth that they will perceive and recognize and become accurately acquainted with and acknowledge it, it being the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape out of the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him henceforth to do his God's will. Ties right in with what we just read from Romans 4. It is it is important that we keep this in mind, that we don't we don't get in the way, right? We are our humanness, our our uh, pridefulness, our our need to be um, right all the time, right? Our our effort to show how much we know, how you know advanced we are, especially remembering that we once were lost, right? We were once without knowledge, at one point without knowledge. We were once uh, lost in our sins and, 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 and uh, dwelling in places where, where we ought not go and <laughs> with people that we ought not be with. Amen. So Romans 14, again, verses 11. Through, did I say four uh, prior? I'm, I'm sorry. It's Romans 14, uh, 11 through 19. We don't want any of these issues useless controversies. You remember there used to be a game, Trivial Pursuit? And it started out being kind of a fun game, right? And then you know that sometimes you get you get with some people who, you know, just seem to be um, uh, <laughs> blessed with the ability to, to memorize uh, trivial, right? Small details, a lot of small facts about not necessarily connected ideas, right? They remember what a blowfish fish looks like and remember what a bull for the difference between a bull frog and a you know some other kind of frog but i mean do we need to lose our religion <laughs> over it right do we need to tarnish our witness to one another over it no paul is emphasizing no should we put it as a stumbling block no because Romans 14 is telling us if the thing, the matter, the concern, is is sinful to you, then okay, don't do it, whatever that thing is. If eating uh, pork you find is a sinful thing, then don't do it. If, you know, if it's something within, within you and with your relationship and the way you are, then don't do it. But don't, you don't have to go to the point of making that issue a stumbling block or an obstacle, a hindrance to your witness with the other person. Because in the end, right, the Lord God Almighty is powerful enough to see to it that his word accomplishes what he set forth it to accomplish. Just as he says in 16, do not therefore let what seems good to you be considered ev an evil thing. Now, obviously, we're not speaking about anything that goes against the commandments. Thou shalt not kill, steal, murder, right? All that. We're not talking about that. Honoring the Sabbath, etc., etc. Honoring your father and mother. Right? We're not talking about the commandments. We're not talking about the precepts of the Lord that we know. We're talking about these trivial controversies that have caused people to 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 fall away from the church. Even, you know, well, you shouldn't show your, you know, your 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 elbows have to be covered. Your shoulders need to be covered. Your ankles need to be covered. 
you know, don't wear pants. Well, you can wear pants. Don't wear, you know, this. Don't wear, well, if you're wearing this, and you know, you know, you know, those kinds of things that would hinder people from even wanting to speak with you, perhaps. Right? But then pursuing harmony and what does edify. Twice we're, we've heard this now. What edifies. And when so when we're seeking to know, um, when we're seeking to, to grow in our relationship with the Lord, and we're seeking to determine, right? We talked about using discernment, trying to figure out those things that we should and should not do, places we should and should not go, uh, to be in right standing with the Lord according to our behavior and what is profitable to us, right? We should be thinking, what does this thing, this thing, this event, this movie, this music, what does it bring out in us, right? If you're listening to some music, for example, uh, what, whatever music you choose, right? You're listening to it, and if it brings up in you ungodly behavior, ungodly thoughts, right, towards others or yourself, then it probably is not something that you should be listening to because it is not edifying you or perhaps someone else. You know, listening to songs that degrade men or degrade women, well, it may sound great to you, but if it brings about in your mind the tendency to degrade men or women or this person or that person, then it it does not it is not following with your ability to be in right standing with the most high God. If a movie, if a TV program, if a you know a book is not edifying to you or to others, is not instilling and developing, as the scripture says, developing your mind in, in your body and your thoughts and your soul in right standing with the one true creator God, then it is not something that you should be doing particularly on a regular basis and practicing. But we're not talking about those serious matters. We're talking about people who are focusing on, you know, things that are really of no consequence in the end. Because why? He says that our salvation, our righteousness comes from him, through him, and in him. And that the kingdom of God, remember we talked about this before on a couple of uh, podcasts earlier about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, right? Uh, and, and being in right standing with the Lord, righteousness, holiness, right? Being in right standing, walking in his will and in his way is not a matter of the food or the drink and and not even the attire. But he does tell us what? To be modest in all things. To be modest. So does that mean if I'm wearing a shirt that shows my elbows, I'm not being modest? Shows my shoulders, I'm not being modest? And 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 just as we talked about in the first part regarding ignorance, you know, an unwillingness to learn and know and do better. We're, we're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to use ignorance, as we discussed earlier, as a excuse, as a get out of jail card for judgment. If it is, if your behavior, if your dress, if your your eating and drinking, your actions, your movies, your talk, your music, your all of those things do not line up with 
life in accordance to following in the steps of the Most High God, if they do not edify you or others, if they do not develop you or others, then it's useless. What, of, what, of what benefit is it to you? So when we're talking about beginning the new year on a good foot, the biblical new year, right? And when we're talking about continuing on a good foot in good standing and right standing with the Lord, we need to be, we need to, you know, clear away all the things that are uh, inconsequential and begin to focus on those things which edify us and each other. We're talking about those things that continue to develop and build our relationship with the Most High. We're talking about learning and seeking to do those actions that glorify Him. Is it glorifying to God? If you have a question in your mind about something, a behavior, a place, a person, an activity, a movie, a song, is it glorifying the Most High God, the true God? And remember, we've had this conversation about the true God. Anything that is not of the true God is anti the true God. Anything that is not in keeping with his word, his precepts, his commands, are outside of his will and his way. So that's why we talked about before that it's important for us to learn and be willing to learn and be willing to be corrected and be willing to seek the truth. But that, that's one way for sure to know. Is it glorifying most high God? Is it edifying to you and to others? to take part. And there's a lot of activities that we, you know, get involved in that do not build up our spiritual person, our spiritual man, that spiritual uh, part of our, our, our bodies, our soul. A lot of activities people, you know, get involved in and, and will run to do. Excuse my little puppy. It will run to do that um that don't add anything. I, I think the world the world calls it calls it a uh, no added value, right? No added value. If it's of no added value to you, then it's not profitable to you. If it's of no added value to you, then it's it's not uh, it's not, you're not being a good steward of the time that the Lord has given you. Remember in the first part of this we talked about uh, our time because the Lord wants us to learn teach me to count my days teach me to observe your ways right well he's given us a certain amount of time and we don't know how much that time is none of us knows when our last day is but wouldn't it be wouldn't it be awful if you, oh, the puppies excuse me excuse me uh, the puppies are having a great time inside. I'm sorry if they're uh, being too loud. Uh, but wouldn't it be awful to get to the to to the end, right, to the end of your days, and to find out that you squandered it by doing what? You know, a lot. Of, the world would have you think about, uh, you know, sleep is overrated and this is overrated. And then, you know, multitasking is the way to go. You know, all that. Activities as remember, Ecclesiastes is very good about pointing out to us that all of it is futility, all of it is vain. You start right out there with Ecclesiastes chapter one. I mean, it, he Solomon wastes no time getting in there to tell you, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter one. And it starts it after he announces who he is, the words. These are the words of the preacher, the son of David, the king of Jerusalem. So we know it's J J uh, Solomon. And he gets right in, in chapter, in verse 2. And he says, vapor of vapors and futility of futilities, says the preacher. 
vapor of vapors and futility of, he repeats it futility of futilities all is vanity emptiness falsity and vainglory and then he refers you back to Romans 8 and 20 what profit what profit does a man have left of all his toil at which he toils under the sun is life worth living he's asking himself the question because remember Solomon was was wise because he asked for it he prayed for it he asked God to give him wisdom and now he's going through this process in his own mind with this with the Holy Spirit wisdom that he's been given and and beginning to ask questions right about it and as you continue to read you know he's pointing out in like in verse 9 the thing that has been is what is it is what will be the thing that has been it is what will be again right there we didn't have to go any further history repeats itself and that which has been done is that which will be done again and there is nothing new under the sun i know that you've you've heard this before right there is no remembrance verse 11 there is no remembrance of former happenings or men neither will be, and this is this is getting deep right neither will there be any remembrance of happenings of generations that are to come by those who are to come after them and and we see this we see this in our in our in our experiences unfortunately right to some to some extent because we don't we don't know the past we don't remember the past and therefore we're repeating the past but i i would beg you to to read Ecclesiastes. There's only only four. Uh, I believe there's only four chapters, and uh, uh, I meant to say, yeah, I'm sorry, twelve chapters. But if you read through the twelve chapters, they're very short. You know, they're not very very terribly long. And said the first four chapters are uh, probably the meat of the the meat of the text, right? Uh, but he starts by letting you know right away that all this other stuff is, first of all, it's all a vapor because it's all going to go away. Do you realize that your time on the earth, if you're blessed to live 80 years, right, and you put that in perspective, it is in no way, in any shape, form, a comparison right, to the thousands of years that has passed. All right. Another part of this idea should be that we can have, and we spoke about this before, that we should be able to study to show ourselves approved so that we can have an answer, right? And so many people are focusing right now on other uh, types of uh, useless controversies. Like, for example, oh, the flood isn't really possible because uh, it didn't really cover the whole earth and it was only in one locale and um did it really happen and you know all these kinds of things noah's flood well how do you explain fossils of sea creatures on some of the highest pinnacles and mountains how do you explain them in some of the most arid or landlocked uh soil how did they get how'd they get there Somebody go and plant them there so that you could discover them later? Probably not. Well, what about this notion that the flood, well, the flood was only local. Well, if that's the case, then God is a liar. God does not lie. He said he gave the promise in the rainbow, right, that he would no more ever again cover the earth with water. You look at the wording of the scripture. So therefore, if it was only local, if it was local that he was speaking of, then he's lying. Because we know that we've had local floods. Just talk to the people in Mississippi, talk to some people in France, right, where the flooding has been occurring. Those are local floods to those particular regions, that particular area. He did not, he was not clearly not talking about local floods because we still have local floods but we have not ever
never had since. A flood that has covered the entire earth. Tsunamis. Right? Flooding. But it's localized to a certain area, a certain uh, uh, part of a certain continent. Not, again, not the whole earth. What about the idea that, well, you know, how could it be possible that the, the ark, Noah's ark, would be able to uh, house all those animals? Well, I think you have to ask yourself the question. All what animals? Remember, he said specifically two of certain types and seven of another type. And it didn't mean that all of them had to be full-grown animals. But even if they were, then um, one need not only look to the size of the, of the, of the ark. The ark was supposedly about the size, it's estimated about the size of one of our medium-sized cargo ships that we have today. We're talking about 500 500 feet long, right? So that's five football fields. One after another. And then some 80 feet tall, or excuse me, 80 feet wide. And then some 60 to 80 feet tall. And the, the definition of uh, of a cubit in those days would have been the would have been the royal cubit, right, the, of the king or of the governing person uh, in those days. And and generally speaking, the cubit is uh, eighteen inches to twenty to twenty some inches. Obviously, a cubit is from you know the usually from the elbow to the tip of your finger. So obviously, if you're a shorter person or perhaps a female versus a male. Maybe your, you know, from your tip of your elbow to your fingertip uh, is shorter than, than, you know, someone who's very tall or someone may who, who, who's male. But that would be the difference. So they would use the royal or the, or the established one for that area or that time. And possibly in this case, it was Noah's himself, his, his distance from, eight, you know, his elbow to the tip of his his finger, the middle finger. So we're talking roughly 20 inches. So if you were measuring, again, if you come out to some 500, 500 feet, and all that, what, two or three, 80, 80 feet tall is eight stories. Have you ever stood next to an eight-story building? Have you ever stood an elephant next to an eight-story building? So it is very conceivable that the ark was sufficient of size and, and certainly the, uh, the make of it. When he told him what wood to use and how exactly to put it, seal it up. Or what about this idea that, well, the earth is flat? Well, if the earth is flat, then, then the Lord again was lying because he tells us clearly to look at the, the cycle of the moon. The cycle of the sun. He didn't say the distance. He said the cycle. Right? Um, so all these things that people want to just, you know, silly things that they want to argue over. Things that, will it save your soul? Will it save your soul to argue about the height, and the capacity, and the ability of the ark to house the animals. Is it, is it crucial to your salvation? Does, that, you know, do, does this edify or build up you or the body of Christ? Or does it tear down? Does it cause confusion? These things are time wasters. And this is what leads into the next focus of this, of this second part. And I'm talking about deception. You know, we talked a little bit before about discernment in December. And we talked a little bit before about ignorance and indifference. But all these things, ignorance and indifference, deception leads to idolatry. And we're making that connection now. 
But if we're unwilling to know, unwilling to learn, unwilling to listen, refuse to listen, right? Refuse to be educated, refuse to hear the truth, then we would be susceptible to deception. We would be uh, uh, prone to doing foolish things and acting in foolish ways and following down foolish paths. Right? If you refuse to pay attention to the red light, you refuse to find out what the meaning of the red light is, you refuse to understand the uh, operation of the brakes on your vehicle or bicycle, you just refuse, then the possibility is you're going to go down a foolish path and it will not be edifying to yourself or to others. And in fact, in this case, it might lead you to death, a physical death. But now we're talking about what is, how does this affect our salvation? How does it affect our relationship with the Most High God? That too is a deadly path if we're not willing to learn, to seek out, and to discover the truths that God has laid out for us to understand. And by saying it doesn't exist, by denying it exists, by, you know, oh, well, I see the Bible on the table, but I just will not pick it up, right? <laughs> I've, got, I've got the owner's manual, but I just, I'm not going to read it. I've got the recipe book, but well, who needs the recipe book, right? Oh, but if we want to know what show is on, we'll watch, we'll look at that TV guide. Remember the back in the day when you used to get the TV guide? We will look at that playlist, as, you know, for some music. And if we get a new, get a new phone or computer or tablet, you know, a lot of people want to know how those operate, but we'll not pick up the owner's manual, the B I B L E, the basic instructions before leaving Earth, to make sure that they're edifying and building up themselves and others, establishing a relationship founded on the truth of the Most High God that He's laid out for us. These things, uh, a lot of these idle conversations, right, and time wasters, and in actuality, trivial pursuits, right? Is it really going to be salvation to you? Are you really going to maintain your right standing with the Lord if you become the best, uh, you know, basket weaver? Is spending more time learning basket weaving, bicycling, you know, uh, doing the gritty and other things, is that is that going to save your soul? Is that going to save anybody else's soul? Well, that might... Learning to do the gritty might help you to talk to other people about your witness and your trials and tribulations and how you've overcome through the power and the you know the power of the Holy Spirit. But it is it, it, it of itself, right, doing the gritty is not going to save you. And spending a whole lot of time learning how to do it is not gonna save you or anybody else. So we need to focus on what being in right standing and being on good foot, not just at this beginning of the year, but throughout the year, whatever time we're allotted, doing those things and involving ourselves in things that are edifying and build us up, increase our understanding, and therefore our relationship with the Most High God, helping us to avoid the traps and deceptions of the evil ones. Those who, remember, only come to steal, kill, and destroy. Right? If you can answer those questions, will this information brings salvation, education, education. Will it glorify God? How does it impact my life? How does it impact my spiritual development? How does it impact my wisdom? How does it impact my witness to others? 
is it, it does it pertain to life and godliness? Because when the Lord does the separation, right, between the goats and the sheep, between the unholy and the holy, he's not going to ask you how well you can do the gritty or any of those other things. He's going to ask you, did you put all that other stuff before me? And that's where the idolatry comes in. And as we talked about before, deception is successful wherever and whenever we lack knowledge. Whenever and wherever deception is successful is when there is a lack of knowledge. Amen. So ultimately, this deception, the idolatry, the greed, because Colossians, I believe it is in Colossians. Let me just make sure I get that um, correct for you. I believe it's in Colossians uh, where, uh, yes, Colossians chapter three and starting with verse one. You can see the direct correlation that I'm speaking of here. Colossians chapter 3, starting with verse 1. We're going to make emphasis on verse 5. If then you have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above. We could leave it right there because we know that what is above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, right there, we can share in that eternal life, the eternal treasure, those things that where moth, right, and rust does not corrode. And verse two, and set your minds and keep them set on what is above the higher things, not on the things that are on the earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in the splendor of his glory. Verse 5. So kill deaden, deprive of power, the evil desires lurking in your members for those animal impulses and all that is earthly in you that is employed in sin, sexual vice, impurity, sensual appetites, unholy desires, and all greed and covetousness, for that is idolatry. The divine of self and other created things, the de excuse me, deifying of yourself and other created things instead of God. It is on this, it is on account of these very sins that the holy anger of God is ever coming upon the sons of disobedience, those who are obstinately opposed to the divine will. Obstinately opposed to the divine will. Those are the things, right? So, so we can clearly judge by any of these, any of this information, are we experiencing, are we uh, embracing, right, unholy desires and all greed. Why do people work excessive numbers of hours to pay for all the excessive numbers of things, right? <laughs> I'm, I mean, it's just fact, right? We spend a lot of money on a lot of stuff. 
that if we eliminated, we could cut our work time maybe by 10 or 20 percent. There are people, you know, that work 80 plus hours a week to pay for and support, right, the sustenance of things or sustaining things that have nothing to do with their right standing with the Almighty, have nothing to do with glorifying God, have nothing to do with edifying and building up the body of Christ, the church, have nothing to do with increasing knowledge and wisdom. Instead, they make gods of all of these things. That's basically what this is telling us. All the things, all the stuff, all the people, the workplace, the boss, the president, the this, the that, the other, all these things that we deify, animals, children, cars. You know, there's some people, oh, they don't want you to drop a crumb in their car. Woo! Right? I don't want you to step foot in their house unless you do this, that, and the other, turn around in two steps and, you know, I mean, you, you've met these people. Lord, Lord, forgive us if we're one of those people, right? But I mean, we, <laughs> we, we focus so much on, on stuff and things that don't have anything to do with building up our relationships, solidifying and making permanent our relationship with the Most High God. So one of the first things that we can do for this year, for this beginning of this year and, and, and the whole year, right, as we're approaching it, the, the thir- first thing that we can do is to increase our knowledge and understanding by decreasing our ignorance and our stubbornness, right, as we spoke about in part one. We want to measure them up to what God just laid out. What is really of the kingdom of God? What is really of being in right standing? How can we secure? Because listen, if indeed, as some people out there say, that the rapture could happen at any moment, any given moment, the rapture can happen. Well, in that case, we ought to be living that way. Right? So at any given moment, remember there's a scripture that talks about what will, what will the Lord find you doing? What will the master find his servant doing when he returns? That's you and me. What will the master find you doing? Will you be learning to do the gritty? Or some other nonsense? Or will you be looking to edify and glorify him through your actions, your thoughts, and your behavior? Are you are, are you going to point to your barn full of... Uh, You know, rotten wheat? Well, Lord, I I stored up all this rotten food. I stored up all this stuff in my in my storehouses. And then he's gonna say, Yeah. Can't take it with you. No U Hauls going up to heaven during the rapture. In fact, remember when the Lord sent the disciples out he told them don't take anything don't take scripts don't and take one coat one pair of shoes don't worry about what you're going to eat or where you're going to lay your head the lord will provide it for you so certainly if that is the case when we're going out to preach and teach and spread the word the gospel of, of our lord then certainly on the day of the rapture at that moment in a twinkling of an eye you're not going to be able to run back and get your uh, whatever bag that is you spent five hundred dollars on or whatever shoes it is that you know that you spent two hundred dollars on you're not going to be able to go run grab your best most famous golf clubs and the best uh you know bowling ball and you're not gonna that that five hundred dollar or whatever tool you just bought can't go with you that's why he says right lay up and above, think about those things above, seek those things above, lay up in store those things in heaven, right, where moth and mildew and rust.
bugs and canker worms cannot destroy. Those are the kinds of things that we ought to be focusing on because I don't believe that he can just come at any time. As I said before, I think there's an appointed time. We talked about the appointed seasons in Leviticus 23, and I'm going to keep repeating that because uh, he gave specific seasons. You know, people talk about all the things. Well, what would we celebrate if we don't do? Well, look at the look at the seven festivals that the Lord laid out. Every every quarter, every you know, so many months, there's a season, there's a festival, there's uh, something that the Lord has set aside for us to 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 uh, enjoy with Him, to enjoy with family, to enjoy with others who are our brothers in Christ, our brothers and sisters in Christ, in in the Lord, right? Those of the body of Christ. There are a lot of things that He set aside specifically to to celebrate feast days, as they're called, festivals, right, unto the Lord. So we don't need to be focusing on pagan activities, pagan obsessions. Let us go also to Second Peter, uh, chapter 3, and then we'll soon be wrapping up this second part. Second Peter, chapter 3, verse 10. And 11, speaking of the rapture, right? But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will vanish and pass away with a thunderous crash, and the material elements of the universe will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and the works there are upon it will be burned up. So all that stuff you got stored, at, you know, uh, the you stored or the whatever the <laughs> in the in the pod and at the public storage and all those places burned up, burned up, not going with you. Right? Material elements of the universe will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. Mm -hmm. Since. Verse 11, since all these things are thus in the process of being dissolved, all of these things are in the process of being dissolved, right? Because that is key. That is a key um, component of what sin did. In the garden with Adam and Eve and all of the animals and everything that he created, there was no death until sin came in. That's why, right, the wages of sin is death. Man did not start deteriorating, right, or dissolving until after sin came in. So when, again, you know, I spoke about this some time ago, and, and I'll continue to repeat it until someone sends me a comment or email or something that says I'm wrong, right, and I'll learn from that. But, you know, Adam lived, Less than a thousand years. The year for a thousand years, right? Concept in prophecy. So he lived less than a thousand years, which would have been a day, the first day. A day is as a year. Then, so there's where the sin came in and he died. The physical death. Then there was a, there was the spiritual death because it was a, he and she were put out of the garden. They were separated from affiliating with, from walking with the Lord, so there was the distance, right, you see, so we got a physical death that occurred in time, not at the designated time, because had there been no sin, there would have been no death, then there was the spiritual separation, the relationship was, was dissolving, right, and, and look at us now, we are further and further away from that day, in the garden, so our relationship has been at risk of dissolving until our Savior, Yahusha, Yahweh, the Most High God, through Christ, our Savior, made a way for us to come back into relationship with Him through His sacrifice paying, right, paying the sin debt, the 
sin debt, which was death. And we see how it came to be. And if you look back through the scriptures, um, here's another thing, you know, that other little uh, trivial controversy that people is all, well, the earth is billions and billions and billions of years. Well, the earth may be billions of years, which I still argue, but man is not. Because if you add up all of the years of the generations of those people from Adam all the way up, you come up to, what, almost 6,000 years. So it can't be billions and billions. It has to be what was laid out. So, something not to argue about anymore. Not to lose sleep over anymore. But we have had this slow, you know, dissolving, slow deterioration. And that's what that's what verse 11 is telling us. Since all these things are thus in the process of being dissolved. What kind of person ought you be? What kind of person ought you be? Since all these things, the desk, the car, the tables, the coats, the jackets, the shoes, the, 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 the handbag, the food, the houses, since all these things are in the process of being dissolved, what kind of person ought you be in the meanwhile? During, since all these things are happening, right? While all this thing is, all this stuff is happening, dissolving, in the process of being dissolved, what are you doing? How are you being in the meantime? Right? That's the question. Each of you each of you, all of you, in the meanwhile, in consecrated and holy behavior and devout and godly qualities, while you wait and earnestly long for the expect, uh, expectation, right, the, and expect and hasten the coming of the day of our God, by reason of which the flaming heavens will dissolve, even the heavens, right, he just said it. And the material elements of the universe will flare and melt with fire. What are you doing? If you really truly believe that God can come at any time, rapture is going to happen any time, any place, right? And you have no idea when that season is going to be, then what you ought to be doing, how you ought to be living in the meantime, at this very moment, right? Is seeking to do those things that glorify and edify the body of Christ as well as yourself. Amen. Let's look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4, and starting with verse 12. And this is, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, closing out this conversation about how to really live in the new year. How to really, really live. How to really have joy and peace that passes all understanding. How to have that joy and peace which is permanent and in the midst of all the other stuff. Right? So, First Peter chapter 4, starting with verse 12. Beloved, do not be amazed and bewildered at the fiery ordeal which is taking place to test your quality as though something strange, unusual, and alien to you and your position were befalling you. You know, you know again why it's not strange? Because remember, the world does not love you. Right? It didn't love Christ, and it's and it's not loving you. And remember, we read uh, in the first part that those wicked people are always scoffing at the blameless. Right? They, they tried to tell Jesus that he was uh, evil. Because he forgave somebody. Because he healed somebody. Right? Surely, we shouldn't be thinking that this is odd. This is this is horrible. Why is this happening to me? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a child of God. So I should be living prosperously. No. 
Jesus didn't die on the cross. He wasn't crucified and whipped so that you could have a brand new Cadillac. At any rate, I digress. Let's read on. Don't, don't think it's something strange and unusual and alien to you and your position will befall you. But insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, rejoice so that when his glory, full of radiance and splendor, is revealed, you may also rejoice with triumph. If you are censored and suffer abuse because you bear the name of Christ, blessed are you, happy and fortunate to be envied with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of your outward condition. Because the spirit of glory, the spirit of God is resting upon you. And on their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. And now verse 19. Therefore, what is the therefore, right? There is for whatever came before. <laughs> Amen. Therefore, those who are ill-treated and suffer in accordance with God's will must do right and commit their souls in charge as a deposit to the one who created them and will never fail them. And this is some time, I, some time ago I asked the question, you know, what are you laying up in store for Christ? What part of your life, what part of your book, your legacy, your word, your witness is, 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 a, is a deposit back to him, right? To glorify him, in other words. And next time, praise be to God, and if it's accordance with his will, we're going to talk about um, what you have in your hand. So many people, you know, and it really does follow with this message today. So many people are striving for this, that, and the other thing, this, that, and more, 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 more. But the question would be, what are you doing? How are you living with what you already have in your hand? Amen. So this, it's been a pleasure and a delight for me to come do this study with you. And again, I continue to request your comments and uh, questions. Uh, you can uh, reach me through the email that's posted on the podcast page, as well as if you listen to this podcast uh, through YouTube by looking at basically it's biblical uh, and searching it. And you know, you know how they all say, right? Uh, click the, I don't know, click the, click, click the like and something or other. <laughs> People have a have a routine about what they say, but subscribe and hit the like button and all that good stuff but that's all fine uh but more importantly if you listen through the youtube channel then you're able to uh read the transcripts the transcript uh will give you you know all of what we've all of what you've heard me say and also uh, you'll thereby have a written uh form of all of the scriptures that we've talked about uh, and any reference material uh, that I've shared with you. Amen and amen. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity, and I ask you again, Father, that your face shine on all those who have listened, that, that you anoint them and bless them with the Holy Spirit, and that they forever are in your presence and growing in your will and your way. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen.